And it's BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. My guest today is Richard Jones, perhaps the man who knows the Jack the Ripper sites and locations better than anybody on the face of the earth. He is the man who is associated with Jack the Ripper Tour.com, the Jack the Ripper Tour YouTube channel, and of course has given countless tours in England. And he also is with the book the Illustrated History of the Whitechapel Murders. Richard, how are you doing? Not bad at all, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, you're welcome. So, Richard, um, just in case some of the Black Box Online Radio listeners have not been familiar with your material, what first made you curious about Jack the Ripper and truly made you want to get into this world? It was a it was a bizarre introduction actually. It was uh, it, I came to it through Dickens because I, I my speciality was Charles Dickens. Uh, and of course, Dickens is part of Victorian London. But inevitably, when you start delving into Victorian London, especially crime, because Dickens reported a lot on crime and poverty, a lot was done in Whitechapel. So inevitably, I came across Jack the Ripper. And at the time, I knew nothing about Jack the Ripper. So I started looking into it because my initial thought had been, well, it's just going to be about gruesome murders, which never really has interested me that much. But I found out it was a whole I was completely wrong. There was a whole almost novel in there of social conditions, the dire poverty in the area, uh, the women, the victims, the police investigation, newspaper reportage, politics. And of course, at the very heart of it were these five murders in the East End of London. So I suddenly realised, you know, you've really got something here that uh, or basically you can never run out of research on it because I, I, 42 years later and I'm still doing research. And again, for the audience, would you like to provide a very small introduction as to who or what Jack the Ripper was? Yeah, Jack the Ripper, well, the first thing I should say is Jack the Ripper himself, per se never actually existed. Uh, Jack the Ripper was a letter or was the name on a letter that was sent to the Central News Office on New Bridge Street at the end of September 1888. It was made public in October 1888 and thereafter the murderer became known as Jack the Ripper. But in fact, uh, Jack the Ripper is whoever wrote that letter. And it's not generally agreed now that, it, that, it, that the letter was written by the murderer. Most people think it was the work of a London journalist, and some people even think they know who the journalist was. But the murderer himself, or, or some might even say herself, but the murderer himself was actually the Whitechapel murderer. And that was in the East End of London. And there were five murders between Aug the end of August 1888 and the 9th of November 1888. The first one was Mary Nichols. The second one was Annie Chapman. Then we had the du double murder of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes on the 30th of September. And finally, on the uh, 9th of November, Mary Kelly. So it's five murders that took place in the east end of London, in the districts of Whitechapel and Spittle, or in, in the enclaves of Whitechapel and Spitalfields, over that uh, 10 to 12 week period. But uh, of course, the, the whole point about Jack the Ripper is that name or the Whitechapel murderers. When the name Jack the Ripper came in, it was picked up by the media all over the world. And very soon, these five murders in the East End of London had become perhaps the most infamous or famous uh, serial killing spree in history. Now, are you of the belief that one person committed those five murders that you just laid out? Some people use the word canonical, but um, the, the five murders that you just described, do you think the same killer was involved with all of them? It's a very, very good question that. Uh, the big problem with that is it's impossible to say. Uh, a lot of people give facts about Jack the Ripper saying this is certain, this is certain. There is no certainty about Jack the Ripper. The one certainty is nothing is certain. The problem we have is Jack the Ripper was never caught, so we don't know who Jack the Ripper was. So if we don't know who Jack the Ripper was, it's impossible to say how many victims Jack the Ripper had. Now, the big thing to remember here is that the Jack the Ripper murders, we say five, and you you spoke the canonical five, who are the ones I mentioned earlier. But in fact, they come under a generic series of murders called the Whitechapel murders. And that timeline goes from the end of uh, or early April 1888 through to Friday, the 13th of February 1891. And there are 11 victims on that particular file. So basically, it's saying which of those victims were, were the victims of the same killer? Uh, and there's a lot of debate as to whether or not, for example, Alice McKenzie may well have been a victim of the same killer. 
uh, then again, she might not have been of the canonical five. Some people say that Mary Nichols, sorry, some people say that Mary Kelly and uh, Elizabeth Stride were not victims, that they were completely different, different modus operandi. So therefore, they weren't related as well. So there is a general belief there were five murders. But I have to say the honest answer to that question has to be, we simply don't know because we don't know who Jack the Ripper was. But there is the Jack the Ripper persona that has been created with the letters and countless letters have been written. Most people zone in on the um, Dear Boss letter, the Saucy Jackie postcard and the From Hell letter. And you talked a little bit about how maybe the killer did not write the first letter or create the name Jack the Ripper. Are you a supporter of that, what some people call Ripper hoax theory, or that at the very least that that was written by someone pretending to be the killer and the letter wasn't written by the real killer? Do you support that? I do very much so, yeah. I, I, my personal belief is whoever sent it knew how the newspapers worked. And uh, there are some, uh, there's some suggestion that it was a, a chap who worked at the uh, the Central News himself, a man named Tom Bulling, uh, who worked for the Central News Agency. So something he he think he composed the Jack the Ripper letter. Uh, what's interesting about that letter is whoever sent it, uh, and uh, there was a journalist around at the time called George Sims who made a very good point in his uh, referee. Uh, column in the uh, sorry in his column in the referee newspaper on, on the Sunday shortly after and he said whoever sent that letter uh, he said words to the effect of, if it was you dear reader you would send it to a newspaper but whoever wrote that letter didn't whoever wrote that newspaper sent it to uh, sorry whoever wrote that letter sent it to a news agency now most people would think oh, I'm just going to send it to the local newspaper but if you send it to a newspaper it gets local coverage if you send it to a news agency, it goes out on the wire and gets wide coverage. So in other words, it would continue the story. And this is what that letter did. It turned the story into a phenom phenomenon. OK, though, but you talked about one suspect who may have written the letter. But is it true that in 1931, a journalist named Frederick Best confessed to writing not only the Dear Boss letter, but also the Sa Saucy Jackie postcard? I don't think he confessed that yet. Well, he he, he spoke, uh, he was on a carriage journey uh, or he was on a journey and he spoke with somebody who he he's purported. So we only have that second hand. We don't have it directly from him. So it's not like he suddenly went on record and said, I wrote those letters. It was reported as uh, secondhand information or uh, uh, virtual hearsay. Uh, so it is again, it is possible. Uh, again, as I say, just like we don't know who wrote them, uh, who committed the murders. We also don't know who it was who wrote the letters. So consequently, uh, it, it could have been. My money probably is on someone working for the Central News Agency. Uh, I certainly don't think that the killer wrote the letters. OK, though, but a lot of people believe that one person wrote the Dear Boss letter and the Saucy Jackie postcard. But then we get to the From Hell letter, which has different handwriting. It's accompanied by a piece of a kidney. Do you think the same person wrote that one who wrote the first two? No, uh, I think that that was that that, that was different. The, the, the thing the thing to remember about letters, the Jack the Ripper letters, is that um, it, beca it became almost a national pastime once that Dear Boss letter had been made public and it got wide circulation in the newspapers. People across the country and to some extent across the world began reaching for their pens and they started sending in Jack the Ripper letters. So there actually are well, probably hundreds of Jack the Ripper letters where, or, or letters purporting to come from the murderer were circulating throughout from October 1888 onwards. The From Hell letter was sent to Mr George Lusk, who was the head of the Vigilance Patrol in Whitechapel, or head, but he was the president, chairman of the Vigilance Committee, uh, and he got sent the From Hell letter on the 16th of October. Now, his name had been in the newspapers an awful lot throughout October because he was petitioning the Home Office and eventually Queen Victoria to offer a reward for information on the killer. Uh, this is something the authorities uh, just wouldn't do. So George Lusk's name was constantly in the newspapers and he'd actually been getting, he'd, he'd, got, he'd acquired what effectively a stalker who kept, stalk, who was uh, turning up outside his house, uh, collared him in a local pub as well. Uh, and I think that that's probably the person who sent the letter, uh, the From Hell letter. Whether it came, whether the, the thing that's often used to say that's the one genuine letter is people say, well, 
there was a piece of kidney wrapped in it and it came from Catherine Eddowes was missing a, uh, her left kidney that was taken from the body supposedly by the killer well, again we don't know for certain but uh, purportedly by the killer uh, but in fact we don't know there's no evidence the the the, the doctor who examined it he said he couldn't tell whether it was a, he, he could say it was a human kidney, but he couldn't tell whether it was male, female. He said it had been a, it preserved in spirits of alcohol. Uh, my personal belief is what the police went with, and that was it was a hoax letter, probably the work of a medical student, because medical students could and often did get bits of get, get body from the pathology department. Uh, and I, I've known a few medical students in my, my life, and I can tell you the sort of things they get up to. <laughs> that That pales in comparison to some of them. OK, though, but. In a lot of Jack the Ripper discussions, people do point to the from hell letter that is mailed with this portion of the kidney. And there's a lot of info that goes around that the retinal artery was matched to the retinal artery that was um, cut out of Catherine Edo. So it had to have been from Catherine Edo's and the kidney was from someone who had Bright's disease. Catherine Edo's had Bright's disease. It was also determined to have been age appropriate. I mean, I'm sure you've heard all of this stuff before yeah. many times. Is that just misinformation or do you just dispute it or is there some mistake? What exactly is going on? There? I would say it's largely misinformation. I mean, we, we don't know. We don't know for certain she, she suffered with Bright's disease. She certainly did exhibit some symptoms of Bright's disease, but we, we don't know for certain that she did. And Bright's disease also covers a whole uh, a whole gamut of, uh, of ailments. Uh, as for the renal artery, uh, that that I believe is a fiction. I, 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 I can't recall reading any contemporary documents that talk about the measurement of the renal artery inside the body and the what was attached to the kidney. It was a cut down kidney. It had been cut down. It had been preserved in spirits of alcohol. Uh, so I, I just think it was probably uh, just a bit that someone had got it from a from a, uh, a, a laboratory, probably uh, in my opinion, the London Hospital. Uh, laboratory, which is now the Royal London Hospital, but uh, say it could have been any hospital across London that, that it could, uh, could have come from. OK, though, now we've had a chance to talk about the letters. And I know you said that you're rather uncertain about exactly who Jack the Ripper was or identifying the Ripper to a specific theory. But what do you make about some of the Whitechapel murders that happened prior to the, the Autumn of Terror, such as perhaps the murder of Martha Tabram? Do you think that there is evidence to suggest that that was the same person who murdered the five women that we've discussed previously? I do. I, th I think uh, there were two murders prior to to, uh, to to the onset. There was the murder of Emma Elizabeth Smith on April. Well, she was attacked on April the 3rd, 1888. She died on April the 4th at the London Hospital. Uh, I don't think she was a victim. I think she was the victim of a local gang. Uh, and we only have her account of what happened uh, about whatever. Martha Tabram is an interesting one because she was murdered in the vicinity. She was murdered in George Yard. Her body was found on the first floor landing of George Yard buildings. She'd been pepper potted by 39 stab wounds from the throat down to the lower abdomen. The throat hadn't been cut uh, and the mutilation, there were no mutilations. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> some people would say 39 stab wounds are <laughs> quite, quite mutilations, but uh, there were no sort of mutilations as demonstrated in, for example, Mary Nichols' case, Annie Chapman's case, Catherine Edder's case. Uh, however, what is significant is whoever murdered her did target the throat and lower abdomen, much as Jack the Ripper would. Personally, I think she was a victim, and I think that what happened there was it's a sort of a, I hate to use the, the phrase, but a learning curve for him. He's evolving his modus operandi, which serial killers often do. There's no doubt whoever carried out that murder would have been drenched in blood, would have been, would have had blood stains on them. Uh, so consequently, I think thereafter he developed a modus operandi that didn't necessarily drench him in blood, i.e. he asphyxiated his victims before he carried out the, ma the majority of the mutilations. So personally, I think she was his first victim. But uh, as I say, we can't say for certain. Right, we can't say for certain, but you did say that you don't believe that Emma Smith was a victim of the Ripper. However, the inspector, Walter Dew, did say that he believed that Emma Smith was a victim of the Ripper. Is that, firstly, is that correct, and why is he wrong? Walter Dew, Walter Dew's wrong about a lot of what he says. Uh, Walter Dew was writing many years later. Uh, what we know from what Walter Dew says is that it comes out in his biography, I, or sorry, his autobiography, I Killed Crippen. Now that was written many years later, I 
think it's the 1930s that that was written. But he does say a lot. Now, Walter Jew was actually... Um, he, he was he was certainly in the police at the time. He was certainly in, in H Division. He was part, part of H Division. He was a relatively junior, uh, 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 relatively junior officer in H Division. He was certainly one of the two officers who first went to Mary Kelly's uh, body. Now, yeah, now he did. Yeah, he does say that. But a lot of off, a lot of officers didn't agree uh, that she was a victim of, of, of the later killer. And it just doesn't stack up because a she said and again we only have her account for this but she said that she was a, attacked by a group of uh, a group of men the youngest of whom was aged about 19 and she did survive that attack now what seems apparent about her attack is the motive was evidently robbery she didn't have much on her but she was certainly robbed of the meager amount of money she did have on her uh, and it was quite a vicious attack they thrust a blunt instrument into her but it wasn't consistent with the jack the ripper uh, uh, killings whereas martha tabram's you are sort of getting a consistency it's, they're not exactly the same it's not the, uh, the mutilations it's not the uh, throat cutting but it's certainly going in that direction and if you then watch the other killers it starts uh, murders it starts to escalate throughout so i think i think uh, i mean I, I say i can't say for certain but i think walter jew is wrong or was yes. wrong what he said i do as well i mean just always asking what you think but on the jack the ripper tour youtube channel you've conducted numerous interviews with ripperologists you've heard all different types of viewpoints and do you enjoy talking about different suspects do you enjoy weighing the merit of different suspects would you like to go through some of the famous ones now talk about maybe yes maybe no or do you think that that's not a good use of time I think it's a good. I, mean, I think it is a good. It, it's an interesting use of time, uh, I, and I'm, I'm fascinated. A, a lot of people get uh, hung up on suspects. A lot, a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, it, it's, it's a very, it, it's a very aggressive area, <laughs> suspectology, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, people have a particular suspect, and it's almost like it's uh, their belief. Uh, and uh, you know, to challenge that suspect, you're challenging a belief, uh, and and th there tends to be a bit of what we call over here football footballification now when you come to particular suspects where people get into gangs and they, they it's almost like supporting a football team you support your local your, you support this suspect uh my belief is uh i i and i think anybody who comes up with a suspect and does some research into that suspect and then puts their research before the public i think that research should be heard because i think no matter you you might agree with it you might not agree with it but by putting it forward they are bringing more something more to the table something more to the case and i think that's something that people tend to forget everybody's this is a case that everybody's an expert on there's no such thing as a jack the ripper expert everybody's an expert uh, who starts to read the case and find something out about the case so there's not someone who knows more than someone else someone might know some more than someone else about a particular aspect of it but uh, uh, and suspects are the best example of all. I mean, there's some suspects that are utterly bizarre, uh, and uh, and some of the suspects have been put forward purely and simply because they were alive in the 19th century, <laughs> and uh, and that's it. Uh, so it, it's interesting uh, to see. But no, I, I, I've, I've spoke everyone I've spoken with, everyone I've interviewed, uh, I've, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to them. And I think that's that's the problem with um, Jack the Ripper studies is people don't talk, people shout. And they shout their opinion. <laughs> so to ask a very direct question, what do you think about the prime suspect, Iran Kosminski? Kosminski is an interesting one because he's the one who is named, well, he's the one who's hinted at by Dr. Robert Anderson. Uh, Dr. Robert Anderson wrote his memoirs 1910. And in his memoirs, he said that uh, he, he says that it was a low born Polish Jew living in the heart of the area. He also says there was a witness identification uh, and uh, that, that's all he gives us. He, he doesn't give us a name or anything. What then happened was that a copy of his memoirs uh, was acquired by Chief Inspector Donald Sutherland Swanson. Now, Swanson was the man who had the big picture. He was the man who was put in charge of assessing all the information that was coming in in early September 1888. Furthermore, he's the man who liaised with the City of London Police. Uh, I say that because one of the murders, Catherine Eddowes, took place under the jurisdiction of a separate police force. She was murdered in the City of London, so that brought the City of Police in. He, he liaised with the City of London Police at Old Jury at the 
uh, city police headquarters. So consequently, he he knew an awful lot, and he's penciled in the margin of his book, Kosminski. Now, that's all we get. We get from Anderson, it was a low-born Polish Jew. Swanson says his name was Kosminski. He also goes on to say that the reason that the witness wouldn't testify uh, was because the witness was Jewish and he wouldn't testify against one of his own kind, as this would be the means of the murderer being uh, being executed. So consequently, that that's... A, now, to that point, I, I certainly think those two men were the highest ranking officers with direct responsibility for the case. So if they're talking about this Kosminski and they say that the case against this Kosminski was more stronger than the case against any other suspect, then we have to take it seriously because they were the people who were in the know. What's interesting about them, though, is that Swanson, for example, says that this Kosminski went into the asylum and died shortly there afterwards. Uh, so he says the suspect he's thinking goes to an asylum and dies shortly afterwards. The problem is that we've just got the name Kosminski. Martin Fido in the 1980s, when he wrote his book, The Crimes, Detection and Death of Jack the Ripper, he went got to the asylum records. And the only Kosminski in the asylum records who fitted the description or fitted the bill was Aaron Kosminski. So hence the name Aaron Kosminski has now been put forward. People are now starting to wonder, have we got the wrong Kosminski? Because Aaron's Aaron's behaviour in the asylum, for example, doesn't doesn't strike you as I think the worst violence he has is he throws a chair at one of the attendants. So consequently, he doesn't strike you immediately. And the possibility is that we have got the wrong Kosminski. Uh, it could also be, again, that Swanson is looking back, just like Jew was looking back, and he might be misremembering. He might have just got a similar name uh, and uh, or, or thought he had there and then came up with this, uh, put this name into the margin. So it's one of those things that... Uh, I think because of what Anderson and Swanson say, Kosminski is a good a good contender. But whether it's Aaron Kosminski, again, I just I just don't think we've got enough evidence to suggest that it might that it was. Okay, though, but I was talking about Aaron Kosminski once as a suspect, and somebody challenged me here on YouTube by saying that Aaron Kosminski was reported to have had a phobia of bathing. How on earth would these women, even in Whitechapel, let this man get anywhere close to them if he isn't regularly bathing himself? He must have smelled, smelled terrible. They would have just hurried away from him as soon as possible, whereas some people think the Ripper at least was able to get close to the women before he acted. And my response was, I only recall reading that Aaron Kosminski had the phobia of bathing in the asylum. I did not recall anything about him having that prior to um, being in the asylum. Have you encountered anything about that? Yeah, it was said uh, said of him that he he, he he ate food from the gutter because a higher voice commanded him. He wouldn't uh, he wouldn't bathe, etc. But don't forget that Aaron Kosminski didn't go into the asylum until 1891. The murders were in 1888. So the uh, the Kosminski or the Aaron Kosminski that people are looking at who wouldn't bathe, took food from the gutter, is the Aaron Kosminski of 1891. We don't know the Aaron Kosminski of 1888. We do know, we think, in fact, almost certain that he's the Aaron Kosminski who uh, gets arrested in uh, 1889 for having an unmuzzled dog on the streets of the city of London uh, on Cheapside. And he's, uh, that's one of the few uh, if you like, snapshots we have of him. He appears in court and he seems to be quite cocky. Uh, he certainly he certainly is having an exchange with the magistrate because he tells he can't pay the fine. It's the Sabbath. And so on. So, so he certainly may, uh, he certainly comes across there as not being someone who's uh, lost his who's lost his mind, as it were. So but that's I think that that is one problem. People tend to read that and think well, it can't have been him. But they're thinking they're reading about him in 1891. They're not reading about him in 1888. So you mean he did have the phobia of bathing prior to the asylum, but it was reported around 1891 yeah, or closer yeah. to that date? It was okay. reported around the time he goes into the asylum. It wasn't, uh, uh, say, we, 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 we don't know, in fact, we, we know virtually nothing about him in 1888. Uh, we've got that snapshot of him in 1889. Uh, and again, one of the problems with him is, uh, as with so many suspects, is people come up with the name, come up with the theory, and then they start to, try and slot the facts into their theory and uh, or, or start speculating about their suspect. Uh, and, and I think that's a very dangerous thing to do.
Well, you did mention Martin Fido and how he encountered the name Eric. Aaron Kosminski in the records, but as I understood, Martin Fido had a different suspect whom he called Nathan Kaminsky, also known as David Cohen. Is that correct? It is indeed. Sorry, sorry for sorry for I, I had hours of discussion with Martin on this one. Uh, we used to do Jack the Repeteurs together, myself and Martin, uh, and I I could never quite get my head around the David Cohen, the David Cohen. Martin tried and tried. I mean, are there gaps that I just don't understand about how he came to the conclusion? And um, what yeah. exactly would you like to provide like an introduction to that theory, though, for the audience? Well, basically, Mar 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 Martin, I think Martin realized that Aaron Kosminski didn't fit, the, didn't fit uh, or doesn't really fit into that. So he started looking at could, could it have been someone else? Because according to Swanson, he goes into the asylum and then he dies. He dies shortly after. And so he's very, very, he's, he's very violent. Uh, and he did find this, uh, the, a Nathan Kosminski, or David Cohen, who did fit fit that bill. Uh, and so Martin built his book, The Crimes Detection and Death of Jack the Ripper, around this David Cohen, this Nathan, Kuzmi, uh, Nathan Kamin Kaminsky, uh, and, and then came up with the idea that uh, David Cohen was a sort of a John Doe name that was used for by the authorities when someone came up with like a polish jewish name that they couldn't pronounce so or they could you know they couldn't quite understand it so they gave this this generic name uh david cohen uh, personally i i think when we when we do that we're going off on a ten we're going off on all sorts of tangents uh i i, I just think pr my personal belief is that swanson was misremembering uh when but don't forget the on the only well, sorry, it's not the only mention of Comets Kuzminsky we get, because Melvin McNaughton in 1894, when he does his uh, what's called the McNaughton Memorandum, when he wrote uh, a, a memorandum, we don't know why he wrote it, but he does give the names of three suspects, any one of which is more likely... Uh, He's looking at a man called Thomas Cutbush, and any one of these three suspects is more likely than Cutbush to have been Jack the Ripper, uh, or sorry, the Whitechapel murderer. And the three names he gives us are MJ Druitt, uh, Michael Ostrog, and Kosminski. So that's another mention of the name Kosminski. Uh, so he's certainly, 1894, there's certainly a Kosminski is there in relation to the murders. Uh, but again, he doesn't give us the, the the first name. We've just got that name, Kosminski. And then Anderson comes along with his articles and then his his biography, The Lighter Side of Manifest Life, talks about a low-born Polish Jew, doesn't give us the name. And it's only then when we get the book from, um, um, from Swanson's or Swanson's book where he's done the marginalia and he's penciled the name Kosminski into the margin. Okay, well, some fascinating stuff there, but I think that the suspect that is most widely discussed in the comments section on my channel is one we haven't mentioned yet, and his name is Charles Lechmere. Do you have any comments about him? Lechmere, Lechmere is an interesting one. Uh, I've introduced, uh, I've interviewed both Krista, Krista Holmgren and uh, and Ed, Ed Stowe about, about him. Uh, he, he's probably the uh, for, for want of a better phrase, he's probably the flavour of the month at the moment, <laughs> as far as, as far as suspectology goes. He might have been pipped a little bit in late uh, in recent months by Hyam Hyams, uh, but I think uh, certainly for the last two or three, maybe a bit longer, uh, Charles Lechmere, or as many people would have known him, Charles Cross, uh, is a just just in a nutshell he's the man who found the body of Mary Nichols. So he finds the body of Mary Nichols in Bucks Row. The story is that he then uh, goes to the inquest on the uh, on the Monday, so that's a few days afterwards. Uh, says what he's seen, and that's it. That's Charles Cross as we have him on the murder. He finds the body. He's uh, a man called Robert Paul comes up behind him. They approach the body. They very quickly realise that the woman's probably dead. They then make the observation. Well if she's dead we don't want to uh, do any we know why should we touch her any further or, or what's charles cross or charles lechmere does uh and then robert paul wants to sit her up and charles cross as paul uh, as he's known at the inquest doesn't want to uh, and they say well we're late for work let's go and find a policeman and they go off and they find a police in fact the policeman they find is jonas meisen who they then apparently uh, Cross or Lechmere, depending on how you wish to refer to him, says uh, you're wanted at Bucks Row. And there's then an argument a bit later on as to uh, 
exactly what was said. According to Meisen, he was told that another policeman wanted him in Bucks Row. Uh, Cross at the inquest said, I didn't say any such thing. Uh, I said, uh, and, uh, and he said, well, are you sure? He said, I didn't because there wasn't another policeman in Bucks Row. So that, that's, that's, the, that's the basics of the case. He finds the body. He reports the, bo reports the body to Peter, uh, Constable Meisen. What's then been discovered uh, since is that his name wasn't actually Charles Cross, that his name was Charles Lechmere. And that, um, and so therefore the argument is that because he's uh, lied about his name, uh, what's probably happened is he's just murdered Mary Nichols when Robert Paul interrupts him. Uh, and that's why he doesn't want to touch the body. That's why he's anxious to get away from the scene, because he doesn't want Robert Paul to realise that her throat's, her throat's been cut. Uh, and that's effectively where the case against him ends uh, in that. There's a lot more to it in that the argument then is that all the other murders took place on his way to work, apart from Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, which weren't on his way to work, but with Elizabeth Stride, his mother apparently lived near near to Berners Street. Catherine Eddowes, it was his old way to work when he used to live uh, over the other side. So, but effectively, direct evidence ends with him finding that body in Bucks Row, and it's do do you believe that he then went on to carry out the other murders, and according to Christopher as well, that he carried out another series of murders taking place at the time, the Thames Torso murders. Well, yes, and if anybody would like to hear more about these, I have standalone episodes on all of the suspects we've been discussing so far, Kosminski, Lechmere, David Cohen. You can go through some of the Jack the Ripper episodes in the playlist, and as always, you can hit the like button and subscribe. But I want to touch back on something, Richard, and that is this concept of Charles Lechmere lying about his name. Now, did he actually lie about his name? Because the name Charles Cross comes from, was that his stepfather? I mean, I'm his stepfather, yeah. The father, yeah. yes. Step, so step is that father. really a lie or is that just a name that he was using because it's, you know, he has a family connection to it? This is the problem. We don't know. Uh, he evidently did go under the name of Charles Cross because uh, he was involved in another case several years before because he was a cart or a delivery driver by trade. And he ran over a young boy, uh, ran over and killed a young boy. And he appears at the inquest into that young boy's death as Charles Cross. So he evidently did go under the name of Charles Cross. Uh, what's interesting about him as well is that uh, when he's actually found in Bucks, uh, or w w when, he, when he appears at the inquest, the police, the police obviously knew where to find him. Uh, when he went now there's there's all sorts of arguments that he only appeared at the inquest because he knew that robert paul had given an interview to a sunday newspaper and that was with Lloyd, lloyd's weekly newspaper and that he knew the police would come looking for him but the thing was that he gave the name charles cross so that would appear to me at least that appears to be the name he was known under and the fact he gave it to that inquest earlier on as well so this is several years before i think it was 18 it's certainly in the 1870s so it was you know 10 or 10 years before he was certainly going under that name there the argument is that in all the records he appears as charles lechmere uh, and there's only a few occasions where he appears as charles cross but the honest truth is we don't know we, we don't know uh, you know you, you you can go you can call yourself anything you want to call yourself as long as you're not using it to defraud people uh, and if that's the name he was known under then that seems to be the name he used and the point about the inquest is a, a lot of people seem to think that the inquest was there to judge his guilt that the inquest was to judge whether charles lechmere was the murderer it wasn't the, the inquest was there to establish uh, a who the person who the victim was uh, and b how the victim had died so that that's what an inquest does an inquest doesn't judge you know you, uh, well they will say at the end if they think they know who murdered the person uh, then they would have given the name of the person they thought murdered them. But the purpose of an inquest is if somebody dies under suspicious circumstances or unexplained circumstances, A, to give an identification. So that's why the first witness to be called would be, in Mary Nichols' case, it was her father who'd identified her. So he's where the witness. The person who then found the body uh, on the first day of the inquest, which was the Saturday, the day after the murder, it was still generally believed that PC Neal had found the body. Uh, it's only uh, with, with Robert Paul giving his interview on the Sunday that we get the fact that it was actually him and this other car man uh, who found the body. And be then to establish 
was it uh, death by natural causes? Was it accidental death? Or was it, as was the case with the victims, murder by person or persons unknown? OK, though, but because you're very familiar with reading things like Dickens and you've studied crime in the 1800s for decades, what did you think about the concept of people using aliases? Because as someone who just runs a true crime channel, when I talk about true crime stories from the 1800s, no matter anywhere in the world, it doesn't appear to me that it was uncommon to use an alias. I mean, even for example, like, I mean, if people go from country to country, they had a name in one country and they adopted a name that was closer to the native language in another country. And I mean, I've seen this, you know, countless times looking at true crime cases from the 1800s and earlier. Is it really that bizarre that someone would, you know, use an alias in the 1800s? No electronic databases and people aren't going to be searching for them on the internet and stuff like that. And it sounds to me that it's a little bit common, but do you agree or disagree with that? Yep, aliases were very common. Uh, people had all sorts of aliases. I mean, Technically, legally, you can call yourself anything you want to call yourself as long as you know, it, it, it's only a crime if you're using it to defraud somebody or or, or to uh, or to use it for, for another crime. So, for uh, but uh, yes, sir, and you look at the victims, several of the victims had different aliases as well. Uh, and I think Rose Rose Milet, who was the one who was murdered in December 1888. She had an end. Her, her list of aliases was massive. Michael Ostrog. Uh, when when you look at Michael Ostrog, who's uh, who's the Ostrog on McNaughton's file, uh, his list of aliases is it, we, it reads like a who's who of aliases. I mean, he's, he's he's everything from count count this, count that, uh, not Michael this, Michael that. So aliases were were hugely common. And the thing is, a lot of people go under a different name. Uh, Charles Cross. His, his mother had been married to the, this the, the police this police constable whose name was Cross, uh, and certainly his name has entered on one of the censuses as Charles Cross uh, when when he's younger, and it might just be that uh, Charles Cross was the name that he used most commonly, but of course they say in all the legal documents he calls himself Charles Lechmere. Well, in legal documents he would have to call himself Charles Lechmere if that was his legal name, because if he if he gave an alias and didn't use what was his legal name, then that would have been breaking the law. Right, though, but you did mention the murder of Rose Milet, and that is one that I wanted to talk to you about because your friend Martin Fido went on his program Murder After Midnight and stated that not only did he not believe that she was killed by the Ripper or the Whitechapel murderer, but he believed that she died as a result of a seizure. Do you um, agree or disagree with any part of that statement? This was uh, th this was something that was said at the time. So, uh, the, the police were, were convinced that uh, that the, the, her death was uh, well, it wasn't so, a, so much a seizure that she managed to strangle herself with the, with the cord that she she, she had a cord and she, she managed. To, that's what the police believed. And it was only actually the coroner's inquest. Well, several doctors said no, no, it's, it's, she's been strangled. It's murder. Uh, and it was only the, the coroner, the inquest, that the jury returned a verdict of murder. The police certainly at Robert Anderson. Uh, I mean, Anderson, as good as says that uh, if it hadn't been for the Jack the Ripper murders, nobody would have thought she had been murdered. But because it came in December 1888 and people were people. So we, we tend to think of the Jack the Ripper murders as being very neat. They begin, they end. And it's really neat. It wasn't that neat because, of course, when that murder of Mary Nichols happened, they didn't know for probably several years that there weren't going to be any murders. So the area was on tenterhooks, especially at Christmas 1888 believing there was going to be another murder. And then, of course, Rose Milet is murdered in Poplar, just off Poplar Clark's Yard, just off Poplar High Street. And uh, and she, she and so the press at first, they erupt, or oh, the Ripper's back, Jack the Ripper's back, <laughs> Jack the Ripper's back. Uh, and, and that's it. Personally, I don't think she was a Ripper victim. I, I, personally, I don't know if she was a murder victim, but I, I would go with what many of the doctors said, that she had been strangled. Right. So, I mean, we have talked about Rose Milet, but to look at some of the Ripper victims in order, I mean, we did mention Mary Nichols briefly, but of course, Annie Chapman is murdered, Liz Stride is murdered, Catherine Eddowes is murdered. And then the, the previous women that I've just stated were mutilated. Then we have the murder of Mary Kelly, which is one of the most vicious homicides in the entire history of the world. And I mean, horrific crime scene images that people can look at them online if they want to. I chose not to share any of those on my channel because I didn't even 
want to create that type of atmosphere. I agree. But why would the murderer, if there is a single perpetrator, escalate the violence to that level? Again, we don't know because we don't know who the murderer was. So you must have a guess, though. You must have thought about this. My personal belief has always been you can actually see it is escalating as it goes through. Mary Nichols, her throat's cut, she's disemboweled. Annie Chapman, throat cut, she's disemboweled. He also takes a trophy, uh, which is the womb. He cuts uh, cuts the womb out, goes off the womb. Elizabeth Stride only has a throat cut, which has led many to believe that the killer was interrupted by Louis Deemschutz as he came into the yard. Uh, Catherine Eddowes then is a complete escalation. You can see he's cut the V's into the cheeks, the V's into the eyelids, nicked the ear, uh, no, the nose. Uh, I was being shown... Uh, a st- uh, I, was, I was I was looking at some or being shown some of the photographs of her uh, that, that are really clear, almost original photos, and you can really see the horror of the cuts on the face, etc. And then she's ripped open, uh, and again the kidney and the uterus, uh, are, are left kidney and uterus are removed. So that is certainly an escalation. Then you get the whole of October goes by and there's no murders. I think the difference with Mary Kelly is that it was indoors. In all the other cases. There was a danger who's going to be interrupted. The, a policeman could have come round on his beat. Uh, certainly, we know police came down Bucks Row, police came down Hanbury Street, certainly in Mitre Square. Several police beats uh, took in various sections of Mitre Square. So I think he thought at any moment he might be interrupted. And so consequently, when he gets to Mary Kelly, there's no danger of interruption because he's indoors. So he's got the safety, if, for want of a better word, of carrying out the murders indoors. But it really is. You can just see that 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 crime scene. And I think that's one of the earliest crime scene photographs ever taken. It's uh, if not the earliest, it's certainly the, the one of the uh, oldest we have of a crime scene, uh, the Mary Kelly crime scene. And you just see just how horrific that murder was. But then if you look at Catherine Eddowes as well, the, the, the images we have of Catherine Eddowes are after she's been sewn up in the mortuary. So there, there is one, I think, of a lying in the coffin where you can see the horror of the throat cut. But um, but most of the images people have, uh, uh, and, and, and that, that was a pretty horrific murder as well. So I think you can just see there's an escalation and Mary Kelly is the ultimate escalation because he's got time. The other ones, he doesn't have time, but with Mary Kelly, he does have time. Now, I've noticed that there is a very large divide among ripperologists. Some people believe that this escalation in violence is done due to calculation, and other people believe that it's done because of mental illness, like someone is slowly losing his grip on reality, becoming more and more um, erratic, more and more vicious. Maybe he had a condition like schizophrenia, maybe something like neurosyphilis, and then other people are all just like, this was all done to send a message. It was done because he had a specific revenge plot. Mary Kelly might have been the key to everything, and someone had hatred toward women. What do you think the Whitechapel murder was more like, controlled or um, out of control? I think he's more controlled. I, I think there was an element of control about him. The, the thing to remember about the, the murderer is that, and, and again, I hate to use the word, but he must have been to an extent charming because at the very height of the panic, the women didn't feel threatened by him. They went with him to dark corners of dark places where they knew there was no protection for them. And by the time they realized the danger, it was too late. Uh, he was able to overpower them and then carry out the, the murders and the mutilations. So to have actually got that far with him, I don't think uh, he would have been out of control. I think the argument that people use about Kosminski <laughs> applies here, that whoever it was, those women went willingly with him. Uh, they didn't have to. Uh, but they did. I mean, obviously, they um, the majority of them were drunk at the time, if not all of them were drunk at the time. So that probably the inhibitions and they were probably less wary than they would have been had they been sober. But at the same time, at the height of the panic, uh, they still went with him. Uh, and so if if he was out of control, I think they would have picked up on it. So what would you think about Pat Brown's more or less psychological profile of the White Chapel murder birth that this is some guy who uses, well, sex workers regularly, escorts regularly, and they've become familiar with him. He's somewhat regular, but he kind of has a plot in his mind that he's going to murder them. They're completely unaware of that. And then, of course, starting with Mary Nichols, then murders Annie Chapman, Liz Stride, and Catherine Eddowes. But a big difference with Pat Brown is 
she does not believe that Mary Kelly was actually killed by the same murderer. She says that it's a because the mutilations are so vicious, she thinks that it was someone who was almost trying to be a ripper copycat, but they overdid it. Maybe they were high on a drug like cocaine. And it also goes to show that, in her theory, that the Ripper would have stopped killing after Catherine Eddowes. Now, I know you've said that we don't know yet, and it's like um, still an unsolved case, but do you think that that is a defendable theory, or are there certain things that would um, disprove that or go against it? What would you make of something like that? I, th I think all, f all theories are, 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 entry are dependable theories, because I think uh, my, my personal belief is that Mary Kelly was murdered by the, sa by the same hand. Uh, large because uh, uh, large because Thomas Bond, Doctor Thomas Bond, who connect, commit, uh, he carried out the post mortem on Mary Kelly, or was asked to carry out a post mortem, which he did, and then he reports uh, the next day that uh, he's uh, that he's looked at the, he's done the post mortem on the body. Uh, prior to that, he'd been asked by Robert Anderson to compile. He'd been sent the um, post mortem reports or an inquest reports on the previous victims, Mary Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, and Catherine Eddowes. He'd been sent those inquest reports, and he said that they were all by the same hand, and the post mortem was by the same hand as well. Uh, a lot of people say, well, that was the that's the basis of the canonical five idea that these five victims. What's interesting about that is that the police didn't send him. Martha Tabram's inquest reports, nor Emma Smith's inquest reports. He's commenting on the inquest reports he's been shown, which are those five. So a lot of people must say, well, he, he believed there were five victims, but he was only shown those five victims at that time. Interestingly enough, the next year when Alice McKenzie was murdered in July 1889, he actually does go on record as saying that he thought that murder was committed by the same hand that carried out the previous murders from the previous year. So, um, so that's it. But as, as for... Um, as for cycle, I mean, I'm no psychological profiler, so it's 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 not, it's not my forte. It's not my speciality. But I um, I, I personally don't think that, uh, that that Mary Kelly was a different murder. I think it was just the fact the killer had more time. OK, though, but you said about how there is some um, evidence in these reports that the same person was responsible for the five murders. But isn't it true that Liz Stride had her throat cut with a different type of knife than the other four victims? Uh, it, it is. Yeah, I mean, effectively, her, her injuries are different to the other victims. Uh, Liz Stride's the interesting one because a lot of people don't think she was a ripper victim. Uh, a lot of people think Liz Stride was uh, her murder was a domestic. It was a, an argument. Uh, there's a chap called I don't think we've mentioned Israel Schwartz yet, have we? Uh, no. No. There's a chap called Israel Schwartz who walked down Burner Street 15 minutes before Elizabeth Stride's body was found, and he's walking past a Duffield or approaching Duffield Yard. And there's a woman standing in Duckfield Yard. Later, he was taken to the mortuary and shown Elizabeth Stride's body. And he said, yeah, that's the woman I saw. Uh, so that's the body I saw. Uh, what then happened was, as he approached the, the, the yard, the, there was a man walking ahead of him, a man with broad shoulders. And the man spoke to the woman and then tried to drag her either into the yard or pull her out of the yard. The, the diff, there are two different uh, reports on what exactly happened. The man then began to attack her. Israel Schwartz then thought he was witnessing a domestic argument. So he crossed over the road to, uh, to avoid. Uh, he just didn't want to get involved, didn't want to get dragged in because he thought well, if it's a domestic argument, I'm going to get dragged into. It. So he then goes over the road, at which point there's a man standing opposite in a, in a, in a beer, house, uh, beer house doorway. Uh, and somebody shouts out Lipsky uh, and Israel Schwartz then hurries off uh, and the man standing in the doorway begins to follow him. Or oh, that's what he thinks. So he runs and he manages to lose the man. Now, a lot of people say that for two violent attacks to take place on the same woman in the same gate, gateway in 15 minutes, because 15 minutes later, Louis Deemschutz comes into the yard and finds the body. So a lot of people say, well, you know, that, that's got it. He's got to have seen the murderer. So Israel Schwartz got to be, uh, it's got to be the witness who saw the murderer. Uh, as to a, as to so as to a throat being cut, the police believed that the, the fact that a throat had been only a throat had been cut. And this is the big thing about the rest of the body hadn't been mutilated. So consequently, a lot of people think that what then happened was that Deemschutz interrupted the killer. 
So the killer's actually in the yard, he's cut the throat, and he's about to commence the mutilations. Then Deemschutz comes into the yard, disturbs him, he jumps back. That's what causes the pony to shy and pull to the left. And then Deemschutz makes the bizarre decision not <laughs> to go into the club. He thinks the woman's his wife, so he goes into the club to check on her. Uh, and that gives the killer those vital seconds to escape from the yard uh, and get out, get out of Berner Street, head to the city. Head to, if you think it, the, uh, Catherine Adams was murdered by the same person, then head to the city of London. Uh, personally, I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, it's one of those things that uh, I think Elizabeth Stride was a victim of Jack, uh, of the murderer we call Jack the Ripper, and I think that the. Uh, the, that that's exactly what happened. Deemschutz interrupted the killer. So that that's my my personal opinion. But as I say again, we will never know. Uh, we've got no chance of knowing now because so much of the actual evidence we we've just got third hand reports effectively now or second hand reports. Ah uh, yes, but out of all the interviews that I've seen you do on the Jack the Ripper tour channel, perhaps the most fascinating, in my opinion, was with Randy Williams, author of Sherlock Holmes and the Autumn of Terror. And we've been talking about the murder of Liz Stride, and his Jack the Ripper theory is unlike anything that I've ever heard before. And it centers heavily on the murder of Liz Stride and states that um, more or less Louis Deemschutz was not exactly the architect of the whole thing, because Peter Kropotkin was the architect of the whole thing, but Louis Deemschutz is more or less the manager of the campaign to commit these Whitechapel murders, and that it was all a lie about everything that that has just been understood about the events that happened around the death of Liz Stride, the pony shying at the scent of blood, and then Dean shoots hurrying in to check on his wife, and that he, one of his other assailants, um, um, that's not assailants, associates, Samuel Friedman went to Mitre Square to commit the murder of Catherine Eddowes. It's not a coincidence, not a coincidence, but it was all calculated. Now, you seem to have a theory in your own mind that is rather different than what Randy has laid out. Is there any evidence that you would say that goes against his theory uh yeah because randy's theories uh it, it's very detailed uh, i mean the amount of research that randy's done is, is absolutely incredible uh, and i don't know if you've seen his book but uh, his, his books are about, it's, it's about so thick it's uh there is so much information in that book uh, it's brilliant but, by the way i mean i know i asked a challenge question but i think his work is brilliant yeah, yeah. No, he's, he really is, he, uh, and the the, the detail. I I had the um, in fact I've 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 had the uh, the honor and the pleasure of me, me and Randy walked around the East End of London. We had fish and chips together, and then we took a walk around. We went to Berners Street and we did the walk uh, from there to Mitre Square, and then back to the doorway in Goulston Street. Uh, again, I, it, it's difficult to say. Personally, I, I personally don't believe that Louis Deemschutz uh, was part of the spirit. I think whoever the killer was, he was one. He was a local. Uh, he was someone living in a locality, which <laughs> would obviously fit Deemschutz because Deemschutz did live uh, in the area. Uh, and Deemschutz does seem, I mean, Deemschutz is an interesting character because then he turns up the next year, I think it is, where there's a, a riot against the police. There's a and, and he gets into an altercation. I think his wife got arrested during that altercation as well. So there's obviously the and, and the point about that club is it was an anarchist. Club. It was an anarchist. It was, uh, it was it's revolved around anarchy. Uh, and anarchy, anarchy was massive in the area at the time. As for what as for Randy's uh, theories, my personal belief is that Louis Deemschutz wasn't. But as I say, I I. I I'm not as au fait with the theory uh, as Randy is. Randy's got all the names, all the dates, all the all the uh, the religious festivals that center on 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 the dates, etc. So I, I I would urge people to either watch watch the interview with Randy, or uh, or buy Randy's book because uh, it's uh, it it would certainly give you reading for quite some time yet. Oh, yes. And for the listeners, what Richard is talking about, about how Randy Williams has this theory that certain dates in Ripperology match up to the Knights of the Holy Theotokos in um, the East Orthodox Church. And as I said, it's brilliant because like the amount of thought and attention to detail and the way that he organized everything, like no no matter what, I mean, I think that it's um, genuinely, genuinely a fascinating yeah. response, though. Yeah, and I will say Randy is a genuinely fascinating and nice, nice guy as well. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed our time wandering around the East End of London. And he's, uh, I, f I forget which martial arts that he's, uh, he's a master of, but uh, I certainly felt safe in his company. Right, but 
out of all these years that you've had, Richard, to examine the story of the Whitechapel murders, what is something that you have found more shocking than a lot of the other details or it doesn't even only have to be about the crimes themselves maybe about maybe some of the other researchers or theories or anything what do you find to be the most shocking thing i i think i do find uh, in fact yeah i can honestly say the thing that shocked me most uh, that i found out in research nothing to do with jack the ripper to be honest uh it was a point that was made. I can't remember who made the point. It might have been Sam, the Reverend Samuel Barnett, uh, but it, it was certainly a point that was made at the time. Uh, and someone said that uh, the viciousness of these killings have really got society. People are taking notice. So George Bernard Shaw, that <laughs> George Bernard Shaw basically said that uh, that whoever carried out these murders had managed to draw the press attention to the horrific social conditions in the area. Uh, and he effectively said that Jack the Ripper may well have been a social reformer, that the purpose of the murders was to attract attention to the horrific social conditions in the area. And researching that, the thing that struck me the most was in that one year in, the, in that area, more people died of starvation in the streets than were murdered by Jack the Ripper. And yet nobody took any notice of those who died of starvation. And yet People took massive notice the world over of these five murders, which were tragic and horrible, but the death of people by starvation. That, that, and I think that was one of the most shocking things that I found, that uh, the number of people who just starved to death because they'd fallen through the net. And effectively, that, that's why the victims died as well, because there was no safety net to catch people. If you fell through the net, Nothing was there to stop the fall. All the victims were alcoholics. Their, their lives had fallen apart uh, for various reasons. But alcohol, alcoholism played a massive part in it. And, and there was just nothing to uh, no, nothing to catch them once they fell through the net. And you've got that. But the tragedy of all the things that were happening to people and right on the doorstep, because we're talking about Whitechapel and Spitalfields. And today you can stand on Commercial Street and look just look uh, west and you will see the skyline of the city of london two three streets away the wealthiest square mile on earth it was the boiler house that powered the empire in 1888 and yet right on that doorstep a few streets away people were dying of starvation and i think that was the most shocking thing for me Okay, though, but you've had the opportunity to interview numerous people and learn about all different types of Jack the Ripper theories. And you said that adding the theories to the discussion is beneficial. But have you ever encountered a Jack the Ripper theory that made you just kind of take a step back and be like, not only absolutely not, this is ridiculous. I think that this person is just um, abusing their free powers of speech. Like, have you ever had that response to a theory? I've never had that response to a serious theory. So, for example, for people who write books on it uh, and, and who are just willing to back up their theory. So I think if if, if you take the time to research and you can, you can argue a theory, uh, then I, I think that's valid. Uh, that's a <laughs> certain thing. I mean, Lewis Carroll <laughs> is, is perhaps the one that uh, that may, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, I think I uh, mentioned this earlier. It's basically you can just pick on someone who was alive at the time and accuse them of being Jack the Ripper. Uh, and people do. Now, if you do that, you know, if you say, well, I think it was Lewis Carroll and this is why. Fair enough. But just to say it was Lewis Carroll because he was alive at the time. Uh, you know, just a theory, just a hunch I've got. then. <laughs> Yes, and I've mentioned that one a little bit on this channel. Oh, I'm going to have to post a link in the description box to the episode that I did discussing that one. But what would you say about something such as Mary Kelly was Jack the Ripper? She murdered four women, then she murdered a lookalike woman and to kind of fake her own death so that she could, well, live a new life or something. I don't know why that would have been that hard. But like, does, what about something like that, which isn't just something I thought of? That's on the internet. People can go read that for themselves. Like, how um, defendable do you think that theory would be? I think that would be very, 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 very easy to dismiss that theory. Uh, a, the, 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 the crimes, the crimes are a male crime. I mean, there's, the, the, there's no doubt about it. I mean, there are 
Jill the Ripper theories, the Mary Eleanor Piercy or Mary Piercy. Uh, there's the, the, the Conan Doors theory was that the killer dressed up as a woman. But as for Mary Kelly carrying out the murders, uh, no, no, I, I, I think that can be easily dismissed. Of course, Mary Kelly could have just disappeared anyway. Uh, it's uh, we don't even know that her name was Mary Kelly. We know so little about her. Absolutely. And I was just kind of like exploring whether or not you thought there were certain limits to uh, just proposing a suspect yeah. and so on. But I do have more or less um, one of the final questions, and that is you give Jack the Ripper tours all the time. Do you know exactly how many times you've given tours of the Whitechapel yeah. sites? I've been doing them for 42 years. So it's, uh, and very early on uh, in, my, in, my, in my youth, when I was much younger, I was doing uh, sometimes two or three a day, uh, Jack the Ripper tours, uh, seven days a week. So I, 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 is all I can say is it runs into thousands. I, I, I couldn't give you an exact number. Tens but I thousand, say maybe even 100,000, it sounds like. Could, could well be that number, yeah. I mean, certainly I've taken uh, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people around. I got sent the other the other year. The most bizarre thing was, I, I used some of the footage on the channel, actually. Uh, somebody contacted me from Australia saying, I did your tour in, uh, I think it was 1988, 89. And uh, I, 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 I had a camcorder and I, I found the footage when I was up in the loft the other day. Would you like to see it? <laughs> And uh, so they sent me the footage and it was incredible because one of the things doing it every day is you don't realize it's, it's like when your kids grow up as you watch, your, you know, you don't you don't realize your kids are growing up, that they change. But because you're there every day, you know, the change, you don't notice the change. Same in the uh, uh, sorry, it's probably uh, I must apologize to my children for comparing them to, 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 the, to the Jack the Ripper case. But. Certainly, when I look back at this, I thought, Gee, now that building's not there anymore. That building's not there anymore. That build and he's got this wonderful shot looking down Durwood Street or Bucks Row as was, where the board school is still a ruin and all the area around it is derelict. And the only thing still standing is Essex Wharf on the other side of Durwood Street. And I just thought that's fantastic. Uh, and it was just, and it's one of those things. I just wish back then that I'd <laughs> that I had a YouTube channel in 1982. <laughs> when I could have gone around and filmed things because uh, at the time it never even struck me to go around and film them and by the time I, I started filming them most of them had disappeared. Wow yes I mean imagine if we could uh, record all those things like from the 1980s watching life on YouTube I'd be down for some of that. But I, know, I do have a most amazing moustache in the 1980s. I, I, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> See, it seemed a good idea when I was younger. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I trust you. <laughs> but um, other than Jack the Ripper, do you follow other true crime cases? I do, I do. I do a lot of true crime. Uh, I did, for example, the murder of, uh, I did a video on the murder of Sweet Fanny Adams, the uh, young girl who was murdered uh, by, oh, I've just forgotten his name, <laughs> but she was murdered in Alton in Hampshire. Uh, and that, 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 was, that was quite a fascinating case. I do, um, I, I tend to do a lot of uh, blogs of, of, of cases where I'll, I'll find a case in the newspaper and every so often I will then think, oh, that, 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 that will make a video, that, that will make a good video, that story. Uh, for example, I've got several videos on the murders, murders that took place in Miller's Court uh, in the years after Mary Kelly. And it was those murders, uh, several murders actually, that led the Daily Mail to describe Dorset Street as the worst street in London. Uh, and then John McCarthy comes forward and says it was he he holds a meeting in the Duke of Wellington pub uh, and says it well it's not the worst street in London it's uh, we we do this we do that and it it's really fascinating because you almost see the people and and I do find that, that that so that was quite interesting but I say so there's several murders that took place in Miller's Court uh, after the murder of Mary Kelly uh, murders in White's Road there's the murder or the attempted murder. And again, I've just forgotten her name, actually. Oh, that's my age, my, my memory's going. But just after Mary Kelly, a lady was uh, attacked in a, in, a, in a lodging house on the other side of Commercial Street. And uh, and that they th they chased the murderer from the lodging house. And they thought, they they thought, are we going to catch Jack the Ripper? I mean, as, it, as it happens, he got away. Uh, he escaped along Brick Lane. Uh, but no, there's, uh, there's lots. I'm also preparing a video at the moment on um, the Thames Torso murders. I, I want to do the Thames Torso murders because I think that's a fascinating uh, sequence of Absolutely. murders. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing about that, that uh, 
you probably agree. I don't know if you'll agree with me on this one, but what fascinates me about Thames Torso murders, Christopher certainly believes that they were carried out by, by Lechmere. Uh, but what I find fascinating is that a lot of people go, oh, no, 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 the modus, it was a different modus operandi. It was, it was you know, completely different. Mysterious. But <laughs> irrespective of that, the coincidence of two <laughs> killers who don't get caught turning up in London at the same time, <laughs> killing in a sort of fairly small area, neither of them get caught, and then both of them disappearing just as mysteriously as well. Uh, and I, I think that's a fascinating aspect of it, that, uh, you know, you've, the, the, the chances of that happening, two separate killers turning up, was one a cop, you know, were, were the Thames torsos a cop, inspired by the Ripper murders? Were they copycat, copycat murders? Or even, is it possible that they were, uh, like the kidney, Medical students had just got bodies from the from the uh, dissecting rooms and had dumped them at the sites, or someone had been, I don't know, got, got hold of bodies and was just dissecting bodies and then just leaving them around. It's, it's, it's all fascinating. Well, it absolutely is, because the Thames Torso killer was more or less dismembering the victims, whereas yeah. the Ripper is disemboweling. And when I look at those types of differences, I genuinely think that, you know, there's a different killer. Now, who was responsible and what was the uh, killer doing? I mean, I can't even begin to formulate a theory for the Thames Torso murders. Now, I can explore that one more in the future about was this some type of, not exactly prank orchestrated by medical students, but this is kind of a mischievous action concocted by medical students. I always listen to um, new theories, much as um, you said, for the usual reasons. But um, I am curious, though, have you ever looked into the Zodiac Killer from the uh, 1960s in America? No, I can honestly say I haven't. Uh, I, I, my, my my true crime interest is historic true crime. It ends probably in the early 20th century, although I've got to say there are some murders that happen later. But I, I'm very much London. My interest is London because that's where I can do my that's where I can look at the cases. That's where I can actually go go to the uh, archives uh, and do it. Uh, but uh, I, I, I get it gets mentioned a lot there. They mention an awful lot, especially on the uh, on the channel comments Pe people make comments about zodiac and and the various other. but my my i'm very much historic victorian true crime oh yes numerous similarities in the um zodiac and jack ripper case and i have a couple episodes about that here on black box online radio i invite some people to check those out but right now for richard jones do you have any final send off for the listeners of black box online radio um, how can people find your stuff i'm sure most of the audience already knows but um in yeah. case you want to uh, share that yeah i mean the best thing is to find the tour is to go to rippertour.com and that will take and that's where you can find my blogs as well because i do a, i do a, every other day i do a blog where i get a, a case from the archives and put that on, onto a blog and of course the youtube channel jack the repertoire uh the uh, jack the repertoire youtube channel those are probably my, my, my two main ones uh but the other thing i would say to people is there's there is no such thing as a jack the ripper expert everyone who's watching this is a jack the ripper expert everyone has the potential to find that little nugget that little grain of sand that will help us or take us that much further in the case and one of the things I don't like about forums and etc. is you get people, and I've seen it happen so many times, people come with so much enthusiasm and they appear on a forum and they've got this idea and then they're suddenly just torn down by everybody. <laughs> and I just think, you know, we, we owe it to people to give them a fair hearing, to listen to their evidence and to be respectful uh, for what you've done because that one person who might be put off it by being torn apart by everybody, that one person is the person who in the future might just find that little bit of information and it will take us that little bit, a little step further towards solving the mystery. And Richard Jones, thank you so much. Thank you.